the chances are you know this melody, and the chances are you'd rather I wasn't talking over it right now. The reason being that out of Rachmaninoff's many, many intoxicating melodies, this is possibly his finest. The second subject from the iconic first movement of his Piano Concerto No. 2. At the very least, it's one of his most famous, thanks in part to the work's abundance in film and television. But this broad cultural appeal is certainly no accident. There's something special about this melody. So let's figure out how Rachmaninoff writes it. For this E-flat major tune, Rachmaninoff combines three distinct motifs. A rising line, which compresses as it reaches its agonising peak. An ornamental turn. And a pivoting figure that hesitantly descends. A, B, and C. This takes us back to chord one but we're only halfway through the phrase. For the second half, the composer repeats motif C a step lower than before, and then motif A two more times in a descending sequence. Lasting a full 10 bars, we now have our complete phrase. As well as being long, it also has little in common with conventional phrase structure, which typically has a symmetrically balanced question and answer, as exemplified by this melody. This is also Rachmaninoff, from the lesser-known first piano concerto written when he was only 18. So he was clearly fluent with this classical design, but chose to defy convention when composing the theme in question. This melody meanders in asymmetrical fashion, basking in sumptuous harmony and squeezing every last expressive drop from its many motifs. It takes its sweet time, and that's precisely why it works. It's with these motifs and long phrases that Rachmaninoff structures the whole of the section. Picking up from where we left off, we have a repeat of the full melody, note the enriched texture of motifs A and C, followed by a transition in which both orchestra and soloist elaborate on the A motif, culminating in an impassioned reprise of the melody. Let's have a listen to this glorious passage now. concludes the section with two more variations on the A motif, a canon between the piano and a clarinet oboe pairing, followed by an augmented version played by strings and glistening piano arpeggios. may have covered the exposition, but this is by no means the last time we hear this melody. 
Rachmaninoff uses it throughout the rest of the first movement as a way of tying his sonata form together. Later, in the development section, it works the music into a frenzy and propels it towards a devastating climax. Shortly after, during a quiet moment in the recapitulation, the horn, underpinned by muted string tremolos, plays the melody in full, like a distant memory. And lastly, during the work's lengthy, mysterious coda, cellos play motif A in an ascending sequence over a tonic pedal. This is still not the last time we hear the melody. I expect you're pretty familiar with it by now, so have a listen to the first few bars of the second movement and see if anything pops out at you. Motif A in bars 2 and 3? Or is that a bit far-fetched? How about the last few bars of the second movement? Again, see if you can spot anything. the exact same intervals, I don't think there's any denying motif A in this final heartfelt gesture, but be sure to let me know what you think in the comments. Rachmaninoff smuggles the melody into the final movement too, and it's nowhere near as cryptic this time. During the equally famous second theme of this movement, we see motif A several times as part of a long crescendo. Just in case the importance of this melody was in any doubt, it comes around again at the very end, played by the full orchestra, serving as the final climax for the concerto. stuffed to the brim with memorable melodies, this one stands out as being particularly profound. It's beautiful, but it's not a textbook example of how romantic composers write their melodies. It defies conventional phrase structure and is arranged to accommodate its three distinct motifs. It's the second subject of the first movement, but it's also a structural thread that runs throughout the entire concerto, relating and unifying all three movements. It's hardly original to praise a melody and work as beloved as this, but I hope I've shed some light on how it's put together and just what makes it so special. Thanks, and see you soon. <laughs>